So today we are going to look at the extension of the dorsal and ventral visual streams. So if you remember from our last module, a major criticism of dorsal ventral, well there was a few, but two of them are that it may be unfair to compare perception to action because they are different, so of course um, it's likely if we look at them in detail enough we will see some differences. The other criticism is that DF and RV, although they provide great evidence, a double dissociation for separate functions of the dorsal and ventral visual streams, the problem is that patients like that are incredibly rare. So what we're going to see in this section is instead of comparing perception to action, we're going to compare action to action. Um, so that's already a, a better comparison. And second of all, um, for the most part, we're not going to look at people like DF and RV. We're going to look at neurologically intact individuals, and we're going to see this dissociation in the general public. So you might be wondering why we have a tortoise and a hare on uh, the front of these slides and they're going to be the analogy for two different systems that facilitate or mediate online corrections um, but we'll we'll get to that. We'll talk about the experiment and then we'll we'll bring the tortoise and the hare back in to explain the results. So we're going to take a deep dive into this experiment by Day and Lyon. And there's going to be four different conditions. We're going to look at uh, these two conditions shown here first. We're going to look at the results, and then we're going to look at another two conditions that are in a, a similar experiment with a, a small tweak that makes a large neurological difference, as, as, it, as in a typical classic uh, cognitive psychology manipulation. So this is what the experiment looks like. It's pretty simple. You have a participant seated with a desk in front of them and they have their finger on this button and there's a target in front of them. So the target always starts uh, in front of them. And we'll look at an animation of this uh, in a moment. So the participant's task in the first condition called uh, pointing or reach positive is simply to lift their finger off the button when they're ready and make a quick reaching movement to the center target. So they just move forward to the target in front of them. Very, very easy. Now they, they're told in advance that sometimes, and it's on a third of the trials randomly, so they don't know in advance, but on some trials, a third of them, the target might jump over to the left or to the right. If the target jumps, they're told in this condition, the point condition, to point to the new target location. So if they start to reach, and the target jump will occur right when they let go of that button, so if they start to reach and the target jumps over here to the left, they should point to the new target location. So let's talk about that condition first. Let's look at what it looks like, what happens, and then we'll look at the second condition later. So here's an animation of what these trials would look like. This is a control trial. Participants would not know in advance, um, but just so we know what they look at, this is one of those random control trials. So they, they, they move their finger to that middle target. It doesn't jump, so they just keep going straight forward to that button. Some trials, randomly again, they wouldn't know when, but as soon as they start to move, it might jump to the left. So they, they're told to point to that new target location. On other trials, it will randomly jump to the right as soon as they start to move, and in that case, they need to point to that new target location off to the right. So nothing too crazy, pretty straightforward, something uh, we should all be capable uh, of doing. So for this experiment, they rely heavily on trajectory analysis. When the participant moves, they have a little motion capture marker on them, and it allows uh, them to basically record the position of their, their finger or the hand uh, as they move. And we'll actually talk more about motion capture a little later on in the course. Uh, but by using motion capture, we get these trajectories, and I think these are from a single participant. So the green movements, these are control trials. You can see they start here and they end up at that target location right in the middle. The blue trials, these are when it randomly jumps to the left and we can see that the participant makes a correction to the left and ends up at the correct target location, so they follow instructions. And if it jumps to the right, we can see that they correct their hand in the opposite direction. A few important things here. So, you see how the start of all trials, regardless of where they end up, are pretty similar? And that's because even though when you start to move, you see the target jump, you don't instantaneously head in that direction. 
because remember to prepare a movement or what we're going to call an online correction to this new visual information you have to go through information processing so on every single trial the participant prepares a movement they go through information processing and they say I'm going to prepare a movement to go to the center target now as they start to move they're executing that movement they prepared now if they see that the target has jumped they need to identify uh, that the target has jumped. Oh, the target has jumped to the right. They need to select a response. What should I do? Well, I was told if it jumps to the right, I should point to the right. And they need to program that movement. And then once that's ready, they can initiate it towards that new target location. And that's why you don't see an instantaneous correction towards a target jump. For a good period of time, the trajectories are identical. And then once you've been able to process that updated target location, selected a response, program that response and initiate it, you later see a correction to that movement. Let's look at this a little closer. So here's a control trial uh, and I'm trying to show you here the trajectory of the participant uh, of their finger. And this is a little simplified but we're just going to make it nice, easy, straightforward. So just imagine they're moving in a straight line to that target. If the target jumps to the left, the trajectory looks something like this. So again, it's, it's identical for a period of time until they've processed and prepared that online correction. And then they initiate it and we see this uh, slow uh, correction towards the target. If it jumps to the right, we're gonna see something very similar but in the opposite direction, where again, here they're executing the prepared movement and then they initiate this correction out to the right. So let's just drop the control trial for now. So this part of the movement, when the, the left and the right jumps are identical, this is what we're seeing here is just the movement prepared during the reaction time. This was the movement that was initially prepared to go to that middle target. Once these two movements start to diverge, so once we can see that they're, they're visibly and they also would have used statistics for this, different from each other, we know that the correction has been prepared and we've initiate it to begin our movement towards uh, the, the target jump. So in this study, and this will make a little more sense when we look at the next uh, condition, uh, Day and Lyon referred to this as a fast automatic correction. And what they wanted to know is, well, how long did it take to initiate this movement correction? So if you, if you start counting um, at the go signal, uh, sorry, not the go signal, when they lift their hand off the button, so at movement initiation, how long until they've processed that that target has jumped and that correction begins. And they found uh, that by looking basically when do these trajectories start to diverge and they found it was at 125 milliseconds. That's pretty fast uh, and that's one reason that they call this a fast correction. In the next part of the study we're going to see a slower correction. So Partly why this one is fast is because it's faster than the next one we'll see. And we'll also see evidence for why they call this uh, automatic. So to summarize the point task, the jumping of the target triggers the fast automatic system to point to the target jump. And it's a fast system, so it has a short latency of about 125 milliseconds. And we're gonna see eventually that this is the hare. This is our fast system. Because of course, the hare is faster than the tortoise. Ah, there we go. <laughs> I forgot I added a picture of the hare there. Okay. So we've got four conditions in this experiment. The first one was pointing. Here's the second one. It's anti-pointing. So they use the same setup. The only thing that changes are the instructions to the participant. What they're told here is if they begin to move and the target jumps, don't point to the target, that was what they did in the last condition. Here, you should point to the opposite target location. So they call this anti-pointing uh, or reach negative. And this is kind of similar to earlier when we looked at uh, an anti-saccade, you know, look in the opposite direction. Here, point in the opposite direction. So let me animate that for you. So a control trial, target doesn't jump, so you just go to the initial target if it happens to jump to the left when you start to move, then you should point an equal distance to the right, so anti-point. 
If it happens to jump to the right after you begin to move, then you should point in the opposite direction to the left. So the stimuli were the same, the task is, is similar, control trials are identical, but the instructions on pointing trials are different, on, sorry, on jump trials are different. If it jumps, point in the opposite direction. Here are the trajectories. So green are control trials, and they're basically the same as what we saw in the point experiment. And let's maybe focus on the red here. So the red, this is when the target jumps to the right. So if it jumps to the right, you should point to the left. And we can see that eventually participants end up to the left. So they follow the instructions. That's great. What's odd, though, is look at these trajectories. So they start, they're the same as control. Now here they start going to the right. That's the direction of the target jump. But they're, you're not supposed to go to the right. And participants know that you're supposed to point to the left, but they get drawn to the right. So that's the, the first correction takes them to the right before they make a second correction to the left. And an interesting thing about this is when we look at the trajectories, it's quite easy to see that the participant accidentally went to the right before going to the left. But when you try this as a participant, this movement is pretty fast, maybe 300 milliseconds. So you, it's unlikely that you'll notice that your hand did that. You'll end up at the right spot and you'll be like, oh great, I did it. But you won't, you probably won't even realize that you were pulled in one direction before going uh, in, in the correct direction. So this initial correction in the wrong direction, uh, Day and Lyon call this the fast automatic correction because it's early in the, in the movement. And the problem with it is that it's towards the target jump, despite the instructions to anti-point. Uh, anti point. And this is one reason they call it an automatic correction, because it doesn't follow your uh, desires or uh, what, what you want to do. The fast automatic system, um, one reason it's so fast, or to be fast, is it has to be very simple. So if you think of a very complex cognitive process, well, that involves a lot of neurons. And to be complex and to involve a lot of neurons, it has to be slow. Sometimes when we make movements, we need to make very fast corrections. So a great example would be you're reaching for a glass and maybe you knock it a little bit, it's gonna fall, and you, you automatically, almost reflexively, adjust your hand and grab it so that the glass doesn't break. That is an example of a fast automatic correction. So to be able to correct fast enough so that the glass doesn't break, uh, it's a very simple system. It's quite reflexive. Here, the problem with that is because that system is so fast and simple, it doesn't realize, it, doesn't, it can't handle the complex anti-point instructions. So when that target jumps to the right, your fast automatic system can't say, ooh, it went to the right, I'm going to follow it. It's almost like a dog off a leash when a squirrel runs by. The squirrel just wants to chase it, even if that uh, you know, isn't the instruction from the owner. So we start, the fast automatic system takes us in the wrong direction. And then what happens is a little while later, the slow voluntary system kicks in. So this is a slower system, which means more neurons are involved and it's more complex. And it's complex enough to handle all sorts of complex instructions, like anti-point. So it takes a little longer for it to kick in, but it considers the complex instructions of anti-pointing. So a little bit later, it says, uh oh, no, 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 fast automatic system, that's not what we want to do. We need to anti point. So it overrules the fast automatic system and allows you to anti point in the opposite direction of the target jump. Let's look at that a little closer. So here's a control trial, straight ahead, just like we saw in pointing. If the target jumps to the left, what we see is the fast automatic system takes us to the left. So the fast automatic system sees a target jump to the left and says, oh, I should go towards it because that's what it wants to do. That's kind of the most natural response. When something moves that you're reaching towards, reach uh, towards it. But then a little later, the slow voluntary system kicks in. It's slower because it's more complex. It can handle complex instructions like anti-point and says, no, 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 we need to anti-point. We need to go in the opposite direction. And when the target jumps to the right and said, we see basically a, a mirror image of that. The fast automatic system initially says, oh, I'm going to go towards that. 
then the slow voluntary system overrules it and says, no, 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 we need to anti-point. So just like before, the first part of this movement is the movement that was prepared during the reaction time, when the target was in the center. And again, that target jumps as soon as we start to go, we don't instantaneously go towards the target jump because it takes time for us to go through information processing and to decide on an online correction. Now for those online corrections, the fast automatic system uh, comes up with a plan first, if you will. Um, so it's, it's a very simple system and that makes it very fast. So it responds first. And let's say the target's jumping to the left. It's, oh, sorry, that would be the blue trial here. So if the target jumps to the left, it says, ooh, let's go to the left. The interesting thing is that when they looked at when does this uh, correction occur, just like the last experiment, it was 125 milliseconds. So it's evidence that in both of these experiments, in pointing and the initial correction in anti-pointing is the fast automatic system, because in both cases it responds uh, at, at around 125 milliseconds. So unfortunately the fast automatic system takes us in the wrong direction, so it needs to be overruled by the slow voluntary system. And they looked, okay, when did that correction begin? They looked at the trajectories to see when did it start to get pulled in the opposite direction, in the correct direction towards the target, and that was at 109 million, 190 milliseconds. So this isn't a huge difference between these two systems. It's not like one takes one second and another one takes 10 seconds, but the difference in time here, uh, you know, even though we're, we're talking about just a little over 50 milliseconds, is a big difference in the processing capability uh, of the mind. So at this short latency, 125 milliseconds, it can only do the simplest thing. Oh, go towards the target jump. And if we add on, uh, you know, less than 100 milliseconds here, if we take just a little bit longer, uh, the mind can say, well, what are the instructions? Oh, that's right, I need to anti-point, so I have to overrule the fast automatic correction. So to summarize anti-pointing, what we see is that target jump first triggers the fast automatic system to point towards the target jump. Uh, the fast automatic system, it can't help but do this because to be so fast, to be as fast as possible, and you know we really need it to be fast, to be reflexive for, for situations like when we knock a glass over and we have to adjust and, and grab it before it breaks, it has to be really simple. Or in other words, it's kind of dumb. So the positive is that it responds really quickly, which is great. The negative is that because it responds so quickly, it doesn't think for a long time about what are the complex instructions of this task. It just does the most simple reflexive response, which is go towards the target jump. So for anti-pointing, oh, so there we go, so that's the hair. Now to anti-point to successfully, the slow voluntary system has to kick in. So the good news is that it's smart. It can understand complex instructions like anti-point. But to be that smart, it inevitably has to be a little bit slower you know, about 50 to 100 milliseconds slower, uh, but it, in this case, has to uh, kick in later and it has to overrule and correct for the incorrect correction that was initiated by the fast automatic system. And, and of course, our, our slow automatic, uh, sorry, our s slow voluntary system, uh, that in this analogy is the tortoise. So those are the first two conditions of Dan Lyon's experiment, um, but they did another two. Here, uh, we're gonna see the instructions are a little different and uh, the stimuli uh, are a little bit different as well. We still have three targets, and the, the middle one is the one that always starts on, and on some trials, it will jump to the left or it will jump to the right. So that's the same. What's different is what the participant does with their arms. So one arm they have in, uh, in front of the targets, and what they're told is they're not gonna point towards the target, but they're just gonna move in parallel with the target. So if this is the target, let's see, how can I do this? If this is the target, and this is their finger, if that target jumps to the right, in one condition called tracking, they're supposed to track in that same location. So don't go towards it, just move parallel 
with, with the target. So if it jumps uh, to the right, I think I might have mixed up my rights and lefts there, then you should move your finger to the right. And if it jumps to the left, you should track that target by moving to the left. So you're no longer pointing to the target, you're just tracking it as it jumps uh, in front. So that's the track condition. Now the other condition they did, I'll explain them both at the same time because they're not that different, uh, is of course anti-tracking. So now they're told if the target jumps to the left, then they should track an equal distance in the opposite direction to the right. And if it jumps to the right, they should track to the left. So let's take a what these looked at looked like. So uh, the way you started your movement is actually with your other hand. It was on a button, and when you're ready, you lifted your finger. And that, on some trials, would cue the target to jump. So you start every trial by lifting your finger off the button. Uh, the hand in front, this is the one that's going to track. But on control trials, the target doesn't go anywhere, so you just leave your hand there because it is already in the right location. It is parallel to the, the target. Here's a jump trial. We're not going to look at both of them, but this is when the target jumps to the left. So when you lift your finger, the target jumps to the left. This is a track trial, so you should move your hand to the left to track in the same location as the target. So again, you don't go towards it, you just track over to the side with it. Here's anti-tracking. Again, it's a left target jump. So when you lift your hand off the button, the target jumps. Again, this is, this is random. You don't know when it will occur. And here you're told if it jumps to the left, you should track in the opposite direction to the right. And the question here with, with these two conditions is are we going to see the fast automatic system um, initiating a correction at around 125 milliseconds? And then are we also going to see the slow voluntary system initiating a correction around 190 milliseconds? So this is what they found. So on control trials, you don't have to go anywhere, so your hand is just there. There's no real trajectory to analyze. You're just stationary there in front of the target, which is good. These are all track trials here. So if the target jumps to the left, what did they find? Well, the participant moved to the left, so they followed instructions. Good. If it jumped to the right, they found that they moved to the right. Now, when did these corrections occur? That's kind of the, the most important thing here. They looked at when were those tracking movements initiated, and it was at about 190 milliseconds. And that's not the, the typical latency for the fast automatic system, so it must be the slow voluntary system that's causing the correction in this case. And you might wonder, well, what happened to the fast automatic system? And the answer is, is kind of simple. So this movement, although it's not hugely complex, you know, this isn't like solving a, a physics problem, you're just tracking a target, but that is complex enough for the fast automatic system to say, that's too complex for me, I'm not going to do anything, slow voluntary system, you take care of this. So it didn't take much complexity, all we had to do was say, uh, well don't point, now track, and the fast automatic system is like, nope, I can't handle that. And the reason that the fast automatic system is so simple and can't handle this is because remember, we want it to be as fast as possible. And if we added in complexity to the fast automatic system to the point where it could understand tracking, it would get slower and it might be too slow to help us in those really fast reflexive situations where, where we depend on it. So tracking is so complex, you know, not super complex, but it's complex enough that the fast automatic system doesn't get involved. What about anti-tracking? So control trial, your hand just stays there, good. The target jumps to the left. What they found is that the participant moved their hand to the right. That's great, they're following the instructions. And if the participant jumped to the right, participants anti-tracked to the left. So one interesting thing here is that we don't see the hand being drawn in the wrong direction towards the target before it tracks in the opposite direction, as we did with anti-pointing. And why is that? It's because, again, the fast automatic system is not involved in this task. It's too complex for it. It's sitting this one out on the bench and saying, I'm not going to try to do anything because this is too complex for me. So in a way, that's actually good news for anti-tracking, 
Because in anti-pointing, remember the fast automatic system took us in the wrong direction, and then we had to correct in the opposite. Here, the fast automatic system isn't involved, so we don't start moving in the wrong direction, which is good. They looked at when does this correction occur, and as you would predict, they found it was at 190 milliseconds. Again, evidence that it's just the slow voluntary system that allows us to track a target. So tracking does not trigger the fast automatic system. Tracking is too complex for the fast but dumb system. It does trigger the slow voluntary system. The slow voluntary system, despite just being a little bit longer in latency, is far more complex and can handle complex instructions like track, anti-track, and anti-point. So for tracking, it was just the tortoise that got involved. Anti-tracking, it's basically the same story. It does not trigger the fast automatic system. It does, however, trigger the slow voluntary system, which allows us to anti-track. So you might be wondering, what does this have to do um, with, with the, the dorsal stream and the ventral stream? And we're going to look at evidence that, that shows that the fast automatic system is in fact the dorsal stream. It's mediated by the posterior parietal cortex, and that area is critical to its function. And on the flip side, the slow volitional or slow voluntary, I think I may have used both of those terms interchangeably, our smart system is in fact the ventral stream. So this gives us a great way to compare dorsal and ventral, not with special um, clinical populations like DF and RV, who are very rare. We don't have to rely on perception versus action. We can look at action versus action. But is it this fast automatic correction or is it a slow voluntary correction? And, and those uh, behaviors are mediated by different parts in the brain. So the, the, the dorsal stream, that is our hair, and the ventral stream, uh, that is our tortoise. But let's look at evidence for that. So what we're going to look at is evidence that fast automatic corrections, uh, the hair, are mediated by the dorsal stream. And we're going to look at a new neurological tool to help us do that. So we'll talk a little bit how this tool works. We'll, we'll take a bit of a digression to explore transcranial magnetic stimulation before we bring it back to the dorsal and ventral streams. So, we have learned uh, in this class and as scientists a lot from brain injuries. We've talked about several individuals with, with unique conditions that we learn a lot from. Uh, a few other examples, you've probably heard the tale before of Phineas Gage. Uh, he uh, was working on uh, rail, the railway lines in 1848 and he was in charge of um, tampering a hole, so making a hole in the rock and then putting the explosive in. And this was 1848 and back then they didn't have dynamite, they had nitroglycerin. You've probably seen this in movies, it's a liquid that's very unstable. So you know if you drop it, it, it might explode. Um, I'm not sure if it would always explode, I, I haven't tried to use nitroglycerin myself. I don't know if people really use it anymore. Hopefully no one has used nitroglycerin. Anyways, uh, he was putting this into uh, a hole in the rock with a tamping iron, uh, shown here, and it exploded. And the tamping iron, you know, exploded out of the hole and went through his brain. And the amazing thing was that he didn't die. Uh, you know, he, he sustained a serious brain injury. He survived. And the interesting thing was that his personality was drastically changed after this accident. So before the accident, he was a, a well-mannered individual. Uh, he, was, he was a good worker. After this, um, he uh, used a lot of profanity. He had quite the temper. He couldn't hold down a job. Uh, he, he took to gambling. So they started to realize that uh, you know, the brain, and specifically the, the frontal lobe that he injured, has something to do uh, with your personality. Uh, this, I don't know if this is his actual skull or not, but this is, is this? I think this is the actual skull, but this isn't the actual tamping iron. Uh, but this is actually in a museum. 
on Harvard, which I, I hope to visit someday. <laughs> A second example, we've talked about several stories by Oliver Sacks, and before Oliver Sacks uh, was, was Luria. Um, he's, uh, he wrote two books, um, and a, a very influential psychology textbook, um, and I used to talk about this case, The Mind of a, a, a Nemonist, <laughs> I always have trouble saying that. Uh, this, the, the individual he writes about here, uh, Mr. S, had a phenomenal memory and really didn't forget things. So not a photographic memory, that doesn't exist, but an exceptionally good memory. So his schemas were very detailed. And Luria studied him for, for years. And this, this I forget the, when Luria was around. This was a while ago though. And there's some suspicion now that maybe Mr. S, the person with the exceptional memory, uh, maybe he had savant syndrome uh, as well. But it wasn't something they really knew about back then. Um, so that's why we talked about um, Stephen instead, because we have kind of up-to-date research on, on him. Another one uh, that I'll mention, and, and this, this one applies to what we're going to look at soon with TMS, is uh, two areas of the brain. First, Broca's area. And this is named after uh, a physician who had a few patients um, who, with, with similar symptoms. They both couldn't produce speech, but they could understand speech. So when they came into his office, he could say, oh, you know, how are you today? And they, they would understand what he said, but when they tried to reply to him, um, they just spoke gibberish. So they could understand speech and, you know, they could test it in other ways because they could write down answers to his questions, but they couldn't produce speech. Now what Broca did is, um, this this was a long time ago before you know MRI and fMRI so after his patients passed away so who knows how many years he had to wait for that uh, he then looked at their brains and found that they both had damage in this area so he said you know what I think this area must be responsible for producing speech another physician uh, Wernicke he had some patients who kind of had the flip of of the symptoms so they could produce speech, but they couldn't understand speech. So when they came into his office, they, they would say, you know, doctor, I'm having these difficulties. And the doctor would say, okay, what are you having trouble with? And then they would, they would look at me and say, I, I can't understand you. So these two areas, uh, I, so Wernicke had to do the same thing, wait until they pass away, do an autopsy, and he found damage in this area, which eventually was named after him. And it seems like these two areas work closely together when comprehending and producing speech, because those two things usually go uh, together. So we've learned a lot from brain injuries. The challenge is finding individuals who have very specific damage, because often when you uh, injure your brain, so you have a stroke, it's usually not one area that's damaged, like in DF or RV or in Broca's patients, you usually have much larger damage. Um, so and if we think about DF and RV, they are exceptionally rare. There might be one or two other people in this era that we know of who, who have similar uh, symptoms. And again, science is best when we can look at a whole group of people and run statistics on them. So brain injuries, um, they're very helpful, but we kind of have to wait around <laughs> to discover them or for it to be exactly where we want. Uh, and it, of course, it's not ethical you know, to go in and cause these injuries. Uh, it's, it's also even a bit questionable to, to even do that for an animal, you know. Um, definitely not ethical to do for a human. So this where the idea comes up of, well, wouldn't it be great if we could ethically cause something like a brain injury that is transient, that is very short-lived, that maybe only lasts for a second? And this technology exists. Enter transcranial magnetic stimulation, or simply TMS. Um, you, and you may have heard of this before, but let me tell you a bit about it. We'll, we'll kind of dive down the rabbit hole for a little bit, and then we'll come back to how this applies to some experiments on, on dorsal and ventral uh, streams. So TMS is this coil, and basically it produces a magnetic field. It has a little trigger, and when you press it, uh, a, a magnetic field gets produced, and then disappears very quickly. Magnetic fields are invisible, so we don't see it. And the other good thing about magnetic fields is that 
they're not impeded by the skull. So often if you want to study the brain, the skull is in the way, right? <laughs> um, but here, a magnetic field will go right through the skull. Magnetic fields don't care about bone, so we can get right to the brain. Now a, a magnetic field, specifically a changing magnetic field, so it gets produced and disappears, will, whatever neuron it hits, it will cause it to fire. It will cause an action potential. Uh, and there's this reciprocal relationship between um, changing magnetic fields and electricity. Uh, I think it's called Faraday's principle where moving electricity, so if you think of alternating current in the wires around the room, uh, it's, it's moving back and forth, and that moving electricity actually produces a small magnetic field. Uh, and vice versa, a changing magnetic field produces an electrical current. So we have this coil, it produces a magnetic field, it goes right through the brain, and whatever it hits will cause to fire. The way the best way to use this to be very precise about the, the site of the cortex you're stimulating is to first have an MRI done on the patient um, so that, or the participant uh, shown here. This is actually a, a classmate of mine back from undergrad and this is Professor uh, Laura Boyd. She's a very famous um, neuroscientist and uh, physical therapist at the University of British Columbia who does some really interesting applied uh, research. So, sorry. We have an MRI of the brain. We put this little tracking, um, these little tracking balls essentially on the individual. And there's also tracking balls on the TMS device. And there would be a camera over here that's seeing where those are in space. And then on the computer, it will basically tell you based on the location of the participant, their MRI, where the coil is, if you pull the trigger right now, you'll stimulate the brain right here. So in this case, they're, they're not actually over the brain yet. They need to get a little bit closer. And then what they can do is if they want to stimulate a certain area, like the primary motor cortex, and say the hand area of the primary motor cortex, they can move the coil until it says, yep, you're right over the hand area of the primary motor cortex. They'll click the button on the coil. That will activate the primary motor cortex. The signal will get sent down the cortical spinal tract and you'll see that the hand muscle will twitch. So what happens when we stimulate an area? And the area that we stimulate, what it looks like depends on the shape of the coil, and they have many different coils with different shapes to them. But these areas of stimulation are about the size of a centimeter squared. So it's fairly specific. It's going to be hitting thousands of neurons. Uh, maybe tens of thousands. Um, so it's it's not ultra specific. It's not like we can stimulate a single neuron. But at, at the on the other end, you know, we're not we're stimulating a smaller area than an entire lobe. So we're not stimulating all the frontal cortex. You know, we can pick a certain spot within the frontal cortex. So it's fairly specific. And what happens? You can use TMS in different ways with different intensities. Um, you can do it once or you can do several pulses. We'll look at that in a moment. But typically what happens when we stimulate an area, so imagine you know, we're stimulating this little area here. Uh, when all those axons fire, they all send out an action potential. And for a short period afterwards, they can't fire again because there's a refractory period. So basically we've turned off that area of your brain. You can think of it like we've caused a very transient stroke, a stroke that doesn't cause permanent damage, and that area of the brain, after just a few milliseconds, will be able to respond again. But we can selectively turn off a part of the brain for a split second. Let's look at this in action. So take a look at this short video and you'll see uh, TMS being used both by the researcher and on uh, uh, the journalist. And we'll come back and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what you saw. So one thing you saw there, right in this picture, they're stimulating the left hemisphere and they've actually positioned the coil to stimulate Broca's area. That's why I told you about Broca's area just before this. Because if you turn off Broca's area, you can understand speech but you can't produce speech. And that's why he had trouble 
um, continuing to recite the nursery rhyme when that area of his brain was essentially turned off or overloaded. When he's stimulated, you can hear the clicking of the TMS. You also see his face kind of, you know, twitch a little bit. The reason that happens, you know, he's not in pain, it's because that magnetic field, it will stimulate anything it passes through. And before it gets to the brain, it hits the muscles. So it hits the muscles of, of the eye and the forehead, and it causes, you know, some contraction. So that's why those occur. The other interesting thing is that if you ask him to sing the nursery rhyme, so speech in most right-handed people is, is, is mediated by the left hemisphere. Singing is in most right-handed people is done by the right hemisphere. So if you ask him to sing the nursery rhyme and you stimulate Broca's area in the left, it actually doesn't interfere uh, with his singing. If you move the coil to the other side, we, can, we could then uh, stimulate Broca's area in the right hemisphere and stop him from singing for a short period of time. So after seeing that, which is maybe, it's, it's always a little startling uh, to, to see this being used, you might be wondering, is TMS safe? And I would say yes, and also probably. So we don't have great evidence on what long-term exposure would be like to TMS. If for some reason you had TMS every day for 10 years, would that cause problems? You know, that's something we don't know and you can't really run that experiment. Um, it, it wouldn't be, well, you might be able to. It would, it would be difficult. I'm not quite sure about ethical approval on that one. It would be challenging. And I also don't know who would want to volunteer for that experiment. So hard for several reasons, uh, but it's likely safe. Um, some things that likely play a role is how high do we turn up the stimulation? So how big is the magnetic field or, you know, what's the volume set to, in other words. So you can have sub-threshold stimulation. Uh, that basically means that it's so low that you don't even feel it happening. It wouldn't get your, your muscle uh, twitching. Um, you, you wouldn't know that you had been stimulated, save for you would hear the click of the TMS. Super, super threshold means that it's turned up higher and your muscles are going to um, an action potential will cause your muscles to twitch in that case. Um, so the higher the stimulation, you know, I'd probably guess the, the, the less safe it is. Also, do you go in and have a single pulse done? Do they just stimulate you once or maybe 10 times for the study? Or as we saw uh, when you heard several clicks, are there repetitive stimulation? And sometimes that's done to turn off an area for a longer period of time than for just, you know, half a second. If we really want it to go off for, say, five seconds, we're going to have to hit you with repeated stimulation. And lastly, as we talked about, you know, is this a, a one-time deal or, or are you having TMS uh, every day for some odd reason? It is a powerful research tool. There's a few great things about it. So one, uh, the skull isn't in the way. Two, it's fairly specific in the areas you can target. And three, it's inexpensive. Now it's not cheap. <laughs> you know, you're you're looking at buying, you know, a quite a nice car or a TMS machine, uh, but that's affordable for many research groups. Um, so it it's more common than say MRI research because for MRI, um, so Texas Tech University, along with the help, well, I'm trying to think if we have. I think we have one MRI that's shared both by Texas Tech and the University Health Center. Uh, and, and that is not owned by a specific individual. It's way too expensive for that. Um, so TMS is, is a, a more affordable um, research tool. Now, one thing that might surprise you, or you may have heard of this, is TMS is actually approved for clinical use. And I'd like to talk about that because I think it's, it's interesting. I know we're still not back to dorsal ventral, but let's continue this. Uh, exploration. So this is a, re a review article on TMS from a few years ago and I've highlighted just uh, some of the areas that there is research with TMS looking to see whether it can help depression and this is actually uh, it has been the, the approval for clinical use is to treat depression. We'll talk about that next. 
But they've also looked at, can it help schizophrenia, addictions, post-traumatic stress disorder, pain, migraine, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, autism, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's disease. So when TMS um, was introduced to the research community and, and it was affordable, all sorts of people tried it uh, for all sorts of reasons. So almost any condition you can think of, there's probably at least one study out there where they've tried to see if, if TMS uh, can be of any use. A challenge with TMS, although we know the basics, so it produces a magnetic field, whatever it hits, an electrical potential is, is uh, induced, and there's an action potential, and then after that there's a refractory period. That's the basics. But the exact mechanisms underlying the behavioral changes observed after the stimulation uh, have not been fully identified. So with depression, um, stimulation can help, but what is happening in the brain? After being stimulated, does the brain learn? Um, do, uh, does the neuron grow? Do the neurotransmitters change? You know, at, at a cellular level, at a very low mechanistic level, we don't know exactly how this tool works. So let's talk about its use uh, for depression. It's not used for typical depression. Uh, typically with depression, the first two approaches are medication uh, and, and therapy, often cognitive behavioral therapy. That works for a lot of people, but it doesn't work for everyone. And if those two typical treatments don't work, your depression is often labeled treatment-resistant depression. And in that case, there are some alternatives uh, that might help. And one of those is TMS, and the R means repetitive TMS. Um, so you would go in for a treatment, often 30, 40 minutes long, and that you're being stimulated uh, by TMS. There's a few different schools of thought on which area of the brain to stimulate, but basically we're trying, or they're trying, to influence, influence the mood centers of the brain, which is often the amygdala. And the amygdala is, is rather deep, so we can't stimulate it directly, but we often stimulate uh, one, or a, one or a few different areas on the cortex that connect to the amygdala. And the, the idea is often that the amygdala is overactive, making you depressed, and if we can stimulate one of the areas on the cortex that inhibits the amygdala, um, we can help depression. And there is evidence for that, and that's why it's approved for clinical use. So here, um, is it effective in treating depression? And here in this study, they've given it level one, which is actually the their threshold for the highest uh, level of significant, uh, highest level of, following on my words here, the highest level of research support. <laughs> now, it's not super high support because it requires greater than two randomized control trials and or meta-analyses with narrow confidence intervals. So you have to read the study. I can't remember, you know, are there just three trials or are there, you know, 300 trials? And actually for depression and, and TMS, I know that there are um, definitely a few trials that have been done with, you know, hundreds if not thousands of participants, so pretty good evidence. Now, does it last? What's the long-term efficacy? And for TMS, there isn't great evidence that it lasts a long time. Um, that's not a huge deal. It just basically means that you'll probably need to go routinely to have uh, your TMS treatment. Kind of like if you're taking medication for your depression, you don't, you don't just take it once and then it lasts forever. You keep taking it. But the good news is, the safety of this treatment, it's reached the, the highest level of, of, of safety in, in their uh, view, so it's fairly safe. You know, we've talked about a few of the issues uh, about safety with TMS, but, but it's actually quite safe. And if we compare it to the most common alternative, uh, electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, you've probably seen this in movies, maybe a scary movie, and this treatment, uh, isn't as as like it's depicted in in you know scary films, you know maybe it was a long time ago, but now it's actually a very uh, well controlled um, technique, you know where 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 you know people aren't left with. Um, I, I think in films they often say oh they get electric pulse therapy and then they you know they lose all their memories and it's, you know it's that's not the typical case at all.
So does electroconvulsive therapy work? Yes, very good evidence that it works as well. And actually before TMS, uh, it was um, the, the best treatment option for treatment re resistant depression. Does it work long term? It actually does seem to, to work well over the long term. So unlike TMS, ECT you get once and you might not need it again or maybe it lasts a really long time. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not um, a psychiatrist so I don't know the exact details here. Is it safe? Well here the, the safety rating for it is actually a little bit lower. There are more side effects associated with electroconvulsive therapy than with TMS. So if you have treatment resistant depression, you know, these are things you'd have to consider. Um, and some people might say, well, I want to try the safest treatment first. Other people might prioritize a treatment that maybe, although it's not as safe, it would last longer. All right, last part of our, our digression on, on TMS. So is this treatment common? It actually is. So one group that, that sells these machines to um, universities and psychiatrists uh, and clinics that, that treat people with depression uh, is called Neurostar. Their website's a little different now. They don't have this map anymore. But you can see that in the US, there are many, many places that offer uh, repetitive TMS um, for treatment-resistant depression. If we zoom in here on Lubbock, there, they actually, uh, there isn't a clinic yet in Lubbock, but I did find out that in Amarillo, uh, oh, geez, almost lost the computer there. <laughs> okay, in Amarillo, there is um, an individual, uh, a psychiatrist who's part of the Texas Tech um, University Health System who actually has a TMS machine and, and there it, it can be used. So Amarillo uh, may be the closest place to go for this treatment. Um, Midland as well, and if you go to, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth, a big city, you've, you've got lots of options there. Ah, okay, and do, uh, is there TMS at Texas Tech? Yes. So Professor Tang, uh, I actually haven't met him myself, but I've seen his recruitment ads before in Tech Announce, uh, looking for participants who, who want to come in and volunteer for an experiment that involves TMS. Um, so if it's something you'd like to try, you can always send him an email and ask if he has any ongoing studies with TM, TMS because you'd like uh, to, to have him try it on you to see what it's like. Okay, digression on TMS over. Let's get back to applying it to the dorsal and ventral visual streams. So essentially what we're going to do in, in the next couple studies is we're going to take the TMS coil we're going to put it over the posterior parietal cortex and we're going to stimulate it. We're going to overload it so that it, it's, it's off for you know, a split second in time. And basically, we're going to take out the fast automatic system. If the fast automatic system is indeed mediated uh, by the posterior parietal cortex, then when we TMS the posterior parietal cortex, we should lose or prevent these fast automatic corrections. So here's the experiment. It's very similar to the pointing task from Day and Lion. So we're not going to do anti-pointing, we're not going to do tracking, they're just going to do pointing. So on some trials, participants will reach with their right hand, some trials they'll reach with their left hand, and the TMS will be occasionally applied to the left posterior parietal cortex. And the last thing we need to know about the posterior parietal cortex is just like the primary motor, motor cortex, it has a contralateral organization. So the left posterior parietal cortex would allow me to make fast automatic corrections in my right hand. Um, so when we TMS the left posterior parietal cortex, we should lose fast automatic corrections in the right hand, but the left hand should still have fast automatic corrections because they would be mediated by the posterior parietal cortex in the right hemisphere. So these are no TMS trials. Control, the right hand points, so the target appears in the middle, you point right to it, uh, it jumps to the right, we see a fast automatic correction, it points to the left, we see a fast automatic correction, and the latency of these corrections would be about uh, 125 milliseconds, indicative of our fast automatic system. Now these are the trials where we're going to TMS your left posterior parietal cortex, you're reaching with your right hand, 
So the hypothesis here is that we're no longer going to see fast automatic corrections because we've turned off that part of your brain. So control trials, they look normal. They don't require corrections. But look what happens when the target jumps. The participant still goes to the middle target. And these are kind of interesting for the participant because you get to the end and you say, oh, I saw it jump. I wanted to go there, but my hand just didn't go. It's kind of a weird experience. And it's because the posterior parietal cortex in the left hemisphere, the one that allows your right hand to make fast automatic corrections, has been turned off. But visually, you still see a jump. You still have selected to make a correction. Uh, but the part of your brain that allows that correction to occur has been turned off. So two more conditions here. These are more control conditions. So no TMS, and this is your left hand. And the left hand can make fast automatic corrections just like your right hand. Now we're going to TMS your left posterior parietal cortex, which should interfere with your right hand. But here we're looking at the left hand, which it should not interfere with. So we should still see fast automatic corrections, and we do. So if the target jumps, you can still correct to either location. So this is a control just showing that uh, the posterior parietal cortex has a contralateral organization. Um, if we stimulate uh, the ipsilateral side, the same side as the hand you're using, it doesn't disrupt your fast automatic corrections because they're mediated by the contralateral hemisphere. So sure enough, this is great evidence that our fast automatic corrections, the hair, are mediated by the dorsal stream and specifically the posterior parietal cortex. Because when we stimulate it, we no longer see fast automatic corrections. I've always kind of wondered, well, how come we don't have a study that's looked at stimulating the infrotemporal cortex to see that it will turn off slow voluntary corrections? So we'd have to use something like anti-pointing or tracking there to turn off those types of corrections. The reason that this probably hasn't been done is to stimulate the inferotemporal cortex. You need to get kind of closer down to the face. And you're probably going to start hitting um, the TMS will stimulate muscles involved with chewing. So you know your big, strong jaw muscles. And I'm guessing that that would be fairly uncomfortable. Uh, so maybe that's why this study hasn't been done yet. Finally, let's look back at RV as a second way to look for proof that the dorsal stream is what causes our fast automatic corrections. So RV, she has a V in her name, so she has a ventral stream, so she should be able to make slow voluntary corrections, but her dorsal stream is damaged. And we now know the dorsal stream is what allows us to make fast automatic corrections. So for, for RV, we don't need to TMS her because her, her dorsal stream is permanently damaged. So remember, RV, her posterior parietal cortex, the destination of her dorsal stream is damaged. So she, what we should see is if she tries to make a fast automatic correction, um, it would be like if we try to when we're being TMSed. We can't make a fast automatic correction when our posterior parietal cortex is turned off. For RV, her posterior parietal cortex is permanently turned off so she should also be lacking fast automatic corrections. These are control participants, and this is a pointing experiment similar to the last two that we've seen. So you start here. On some trials, the target appears here, and the participant reaches for it. On other trials, it appears out to the right. So C is for center, R is for right, and you reach to the right. One thing you might notice is that your trajectories, sometimes I simplify those and just say that you move straight. But we often curve our movements. It seems to just be um, how we like to move biomechanically and, and maybe the most efficiently. Um, so don't worry too much about the curvature to these movements. That's actually normal. Now, the CR trials, those are the ones we're interested in. These are trials where it begins in the center. And as soon as you start to move to it, it jumps to the right. So what you can see in black here, those trials, this, these are control participants who have an intact uh, dorsal stream. And we can see that they make these nice, fast, automatic corrections towards the target jump. So that's great. That's what we expect. Now let's take a look at RV results. So remember with RV, she has a V in her name. So her ventral stream is intact. 
her dorsal stream is damaged. So what we're expecting to see here is that she cannot make fast automatic corrections. And sure enough, so she can move to the center, she can move to the right, but when the target jumps, you see she goes to the original target location. We don't see evidence of those fast automatic corrections. So in control participants, they're shown here. See how you make it most of the way towards the target and then your fast automatic system kicks in? We don't see that with RV. Her dorsal stream is damaged, no fast automatic correction. She does move to that new target location, but much later. So she moves, she gets to the wrong target location, then she makes a secondary movement over to the right. That is not a fast automatic correction, that is a slow voluntary correction. So we can tell it occurs much later, it's not early on in the movement, and if we looked at when does this happen, it would be at a latency comparable to the slow voluntary system. So RV is using the only way she can to accommodate that target jump, and it's there's no fast automatic correction, but later on she can correct with her slow voluntary system. So this is really good confirmatory evidence with either TMSing the posterior parietal cortex or looking at a lesion of the posterior parietal cortex with RV that the fast automatic system is mediated, it lives within the posterior parietal cortex. And without it, we lose fast automatic corrections. And if the fast automatic corrections are caused by the posterior parietal cortex, then by a process of elimination, the slow voluntary corrections must be mediated by the ventral stream, which terminates in the in in inferotemporal cortex. So that's the end of our tour on the visual systems, and in our next module, we'll begin a new topic.